Car drag is a huge problem. In fact, cars aren't very aerodynamic at all. While something streamlined like a wing might achieve a drag coefficient of like 0 0.02, 0 0.03, a car is lucky to get even below 0 0.25, 10 times greater. One of the major reasons for that is its rear. Pretty much every car has a blunt rear face. That means that as the flow hits the rear edge, it separates and creates a wake. The wake is low pressure and that engulfs the rear. What that means is that now you have this large rear face exposed to low pressure, which then pulls the car back. One way to overcome this is by extending the rear and making it pointy like the end of a, an airfoil, so that there's no rear wake. That isn't a practical solution though. So first of all, it makes the car much longer. Secondly, it can pose a safety hazard while driving. Third, it makes the entire car just hard to use. For example, using the boot is harder, parking, that's harder too, etc. Another general solution to fixing the rear wake is by using ducts. So the general idea is that you funnel higher pressure air from somewhere else into the rear wake area. That way you have higher pressure here instead of lower pressure and that reduces the drag coefficient. One of the obstacles facing that general approach is that ducting air is usually very lossy. That's because you have to bend it around corners and try to get high pressure air from somewhere without making that region higher drag too. But today we're looking at another duct approach and a very intuitive one. So that's what we see in figure three here. It's a little hard to tell what it is, uh, but on the left we have like a funky looking car. Then on the right we have the exact same car, but now there's this duct over the roof, this like light blue gray region. So there's this large plate spanning the width of the entire car, and it starts from almost about the windshield uh, where it meets the roof, and then extends rearwards. Then in figure four, we see some other angles of it. So it's in perspex here. And the sides of the duct are sealed too. And actually this general design is something similar to what I came up with a little while ago on YouTube called, in a video called, I solve Tesla's aerodynamic problem. In that video, actually, I looked at how putting a plate over the roof helped reduce the lift of the cars. It wasn't sealed at the sides though. Here, the authors have, have a very similar design, but they came up with this idea to help reduce the car's drag, not the lift. So the way it works here is that it's actually very intuitive and genius in that way. It simply funnels air into the wake region. Now, one thing to note about this design compared to my idea is that the top plate here is much more curved, and that's a key difference that will affect its performance. So with this high curvature, it should do a great job funneling air into the wake and reducing the drag, and we'll see later on how it does that. But the high curvature here will drop the pressure on top and that will increase the car's lift. The design I had was much flatter and that is because it's to reduce the lift of the car. So you have to increase the pressure over the top of the roof. So it's really amazing how this general idea of using a plate on top, uh, if you tweak it just slightly, can produce very different results. Anyway, back to this specific idea. So the exact way it should work, hopefully work, is that the air flows over the front of the car and then it goes into the over the windshield and then enters into the duct. It then flows through the duct and up until the this point it's everything's great everything's merry it then flows into the rear of the duct and as we can see in figure 4b it's directed down into the wake hopefully and that will hopefully make the wake have a higher pressure at the back there we'll see later on if that is the case or not now there are a few nuances to this design that are actually very important for its operation the first is the side panels so they block off the flow inside the duct to outside the duct and why do you need to do that well as the air flows over the roof and through the duct it will change pressure. In this case, it will almost certainly drop in pressure because it has that curvature to, to follow. And that change isn't so important, but the key thing to note here is that it's different to the pressure outside. If you don't have size to the duct, then the air outside the duct, which is higher pressure probably, will either rush in or the flow inside the duct will rush out if the pressure outside is lower. Most likely the flow outside will rush in because there should be lower pressure inside the ducting area than outside. And then when this mixing occurs, that will reduce how effective this ducting will be. The air won't have to follow the duct and that will reduce how much the flow will shoot into the wake. So these sides are very important for isolating the air inside the duct and hence directing it into the wake region. The second thing to note about this duct is looking at the back in figure 4b, we see how much it points down. The angle that it points down will be very important here because when it comes to drag reduction, the more you can shoot higher pressure flow into the wake, the smaller the wake will be and the more rear we will be exposed to higher pressure flow and hence the drag will reduce. So changing that angle will probably change the effects of this ducting quite a lot. 
Now, another thing to point out here is just how curved the ducting is. It follows the roof quite well. Like that means that pretty much you won't do anything for the lift because the pressures you get on the upper surface of the duct will pretty much be the same as the pressure that you got on the roof without the duct. So the lift should be about the same. So to look at how this very novel design affects the car's performance, we're looking at this paper here called, if I scroll up, an original aerodynamic ducting system to improve energy efficiency in the automotive industry. It's open access, so you can find the link below, and the DOI is at the end of the page here for those interested. So the authors used both experiments and a little bit of CFD, which is cool because we'll get to see some really interesting information, a lot of information uh, presented. Now in figure seven, we see the car and then the various grids behind the car at which they took the pressure measurements. So scrolling down to figure seven here. So we have the car and then in the downstream plane, we have all these various cross sections. And in each cross section, we have these various locations that they took the, the, um, the pressures out. So the idea here was to see how the pressures at these points change with the ducting. The vertical planes were labeled X and then a number. So for example, X refers to the X plane and the number refers to the distance behind the car in centimeters. Now each X plane had nine points and that formed a three by three grid. In the top picture in figure seven, we see the spacing in the Y and Z directions. So the vertical and sideways directions respect respectively. Now the numbers here are in millimeters. And one thing I should mention here is that this paper doesn't do a very good job with units. So for example, here for the X planes, they use numbers in centimeters, while for the Y and Z coordinates, they're in millimeters. Then for the pressures, as we'll see later on, they're in millimeters of water, which is very strange and outdated. Um, just as a reference, one millimeter of water is about 9.8 pascals, so about 10 pascals, let's say. That will hopefully make it easier to convert between <laughs> millimeters of water and pascals. Now, one really good thing about this research is that it tested this idea at three different speeds, 35, 41, and 50 kilometers per hour. So this will give us an idea as to the robustness of the results the ducting is giving and whether it performs better at certain velocities than others. So this car was a 1 to 12 scale model, which is pretty small, um, but it should be enough to tell us whether this idea holds merit and warrants further development. Now, they don't give us the Reynolds number range tested from what I can tell, but based on the flow speeds and the approximate length of the vehicle, the Reynolds number should range from about 270,000 to 400,000. That should put the flow as turbulent uh, or at least pretty close to it. Now, there's no information about the uncertainty in their results in their experiments or anything about their CFD setup either. So let's take the results as just general trends. And just quickly, if you'd like to learn OpenFoam, which is a top tier and free CFD software, then check out our courses here. Let's now jump into the results. So in figures eight and nine, we see some CFD results, namely the flow speed around the vehicle, which we see in figure eight here, and then the streamlines in figure nine. So first in figure eight, we see a major difference in the flow field around the car in this cut plane. Without the ducting, so the top picture, there is a very large, pretty dark blue region in the wake. That is to be expected. And what that tells us is that for this particular car design, which is not too far off a hatchback, the flow separates a little down from the top of the rear window and the wake is very large. For the bottom picture, we now see this light blue region channeling down into the wake, which is faster flow taking up some of the wake. So from this, from this qualitative view, the ducting definitely seems to improve the wake with faster moving flow there. That's very promising. And the wake size is dramatically cut down. Now in figure nine, that shows us just how well the streamlines are jettisoned down. And in fact, even streamlines over the duct are also flowing downwards quite well. So the ones that aren't even going into the duct, but on top, they're following the curvature quite nicely and coming down quite well too. One thing to note here about the coloring is that it seems to be for the velocity in meters per second, but the authors seem to have put the pressure value in pascals in brackets next to the velocity as well. So like the dynamic pressure, I guess, um, I think the values here for the um, pressure aren't quite right because if the velocity reduces, it could be because energy is sapped away or the pressure is lower too. Uh, sorry, and the pressure is lower too, or it could be because the flow is getting held up and the pressure will actually increase. So a change of velocity doesn't necessarily mean that the pressure will increase or decrease, but it depends on the, why the cha change of velocity is occurring. So for example, if you have the flow hitting the front of the car, the velocity will definitely reduce as we hit the stagnation point, but the velocity will be converted into static pressure. So we'll get a very high static pressure. On the other hand, 
if you have a wake, the velocity could be lower and the static pressure could be lower too. And that indicates just generally a lower energy level of the flow there. So the pressure is not exactly directly related to the velocity. You can say that through dynamic pressure, but that's assuming that there are no losses. So these pressure values next to the velocity values are not exactly applicable. Anyway, let's now move on to the quantitative values of pressure. So in figure 10, we see the pressures in millimeters of water, and that's of the car without and with the ducting. So remember that one millimeter of water is 9.8 pascals, so about 10 pascals. And the three graphs we see here are for 35 kph, 41 kph, and 50 kph. The x axis is the distance in the x direction. So what that means is that let's go back to figure seven to quickly remind ourselves what this means. So we see in figure seven, the x distance downstream, and that is what the x axis in figure 10 is referring to. Now the exact location in each x location in terms of the y and z coordinates, this is actually the average value of the nine points in each cross-sectional section measured. So if we go back to figure 10, each one of these points is the average pressure in that entire plane. So the nine um, plot, the nine points that they took the pressure at, they averaged them to just get one of these values. So we're looking at these graphs. What we find is that for all three speeds and at all X points downstream, the pressure is higher when you have ducting than without. So the green line compared to the orange line. That's really good evidence that the ducting system is increasing the pressure downstream. In terms of the effect of the velocity has on the um, pressure differences, it doesn't seem to be consistent because there's a much of a muchness between 35 kph and 41 kph, but then at 50 kph, there's an increase. In other words, the ducting seems to perform better. It increases the pressure much more here, um, even at, compared to the lower velocities too. So the reason why it is performing better here at 50 kph could be some kind of change in the flow physics. Unfortunately, we don't have any flow visit to tell us. To me, the only thing that I'd expect to change with increasing velocity here is how well the flow really travels over the back window. As the speed increases, there should be more energy for it to stay attached. So it might separate later. But if that were the case, then I think the ducting would be less effective at higher speeds. So why we're seeing it being more effective here despite being at a higher speed, I don't know exactly. Maybe there is something else going on um, that we can't tell from the graphs. Anyway, a good thing about this data is that it shows that even as you go downstream to 27 centimeters, which is about one car length downstream uh, for this scale model, the pressure is still increased by the ducting. So the effects of the duct are definitely noteworthy and are not just superficial or highly localized. Now moving to figure 11, we see some pretty messy graphs, but let's go through them and explain what we can see because there's quite a bit of data here. So in the x-axis, that's the x-distance downstream, so the vertical planes. The y-axis is again pressure in millimeters of water, and again, one millimeter is about 10 pascals. And then the lines plotted are, from what I can tell, the average of values in each y row. So back in figure seven here, in the top picture of figure seven, remember the uh, grids that we saw? So the pressures were taken in these nine points. So each one of those dots in figure 11 corresponds to the average in each row. So Y35, Y65, and Y95. And the results are in figure 11. So the light blue lines in figure 11, so the light lines, sorry, so the light blue, yellow, and green, they correspond to no ducting. The solid lines are for ducting. And across the board, it's clear that the ducting for all three velocities are really increasing the pressure in the wake. And again, at 50 kph, these increases are even greater. So perhaps there's something going on at 50 kph that we can't really tell, and it's making the ducting perform better. As such, high velocities would be interesting to see in the future. Like if you go to 100 kph, maybe the ducting will be even better. Maybe it's just because at that higher velocity, the flow has more energy to be able to shoot down into the wake more. I'm not too sure. Anyway, in figure 12, we see similar graphs, but this time it's the averages in the vertical lines for each plane, not the um, not the rows, but the columns. Now for 35 kph, the legend says here that they're for Y locations, but I'm pretty sure that they're typos and it's actually still Z locations. Anyway, 
we see similar trends again where the ducting is definitely increasing the pressure and again at 50 kph the ducting is performing really well even better than the other two velocities so i think that these results definitely warrant further investigation now another thing to note here is that very close to the rear of the car so like one centimeter away without the ducting the pressure is negative and that's gauge pressure then when you add the ducting for all graphs we see the pressure becomes either zero or positive so there is a massive increase and a change in sign that is very promising because that is very strong evidence that the pressure on the rear face of the car will have higher pressure on it and will, will then reduce the drag. Unfortunately, they don't have drag coefficient data here, but it would be really interesting to see what would happen. I think it's pretty much a certainty that the drag would also reduce looking at these pressures. Now in figure 13, we see the average pressures at 50 kph and there are trend lines shown as well. The data is very clear um, and how much the ducting really improves the pressure downstream. So overall, I think that from a drag point of view, this ducting idea holds a lot of promise and should be looked into more. And that brings us to the end of this podcast. If you liked it, hit the me like and subscribe buttons. And if you're interested in learning OpenFoam, then check out our courses below. And we're also giving away free stickers, just FYI. If you want some, then all you need to do is just pay a few bucks for the postage and we'll throw a few in an envelope for you. You can find them in the link below. And if you're staying on YouTube, YouTube thinks you'll like this video. So check it out. Peace out, amigos.